Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Rip and Reds. My name is Grev. You are joining us on a Sunday evening, 24 hours removed from Arsenal 1, Brighton 1. If you've never joined us before, then we welcome you to this channel. Please do give the channel a subscribe. Please do give this video a like, and please join us in the comments as we are going to discuss probably a lot about refereeing. Before we get into that, Jace, how the devil are you? It's a week since we've been together. You did the last game on your own. How are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I was missing you. I'm glad you're back. You said I did the last one on my own. I hated it. Do you know how awkward it is just talking to yourself in a mic? And I was like, am I talking too fast? Am I talking too slow? And uh, yeah, so let's never do that again. Let's just ban all work trips and holidays. Okay. Um, <laughs> but apart from that, I'm good, mate. I'm good, mate. How are you doing? How was the holiday? Yeah. Yeah, the holiday was fine. Uh, we were just talking in the green room beforehand, right? Uh, kids are stressful, uh, but it was good to be out of work. I got a little bit of a tan. My nose is already peeling, so if you can see that on camera, I can only apologise. Um, but yeah, it was was good to get away. I, I watched the Arsenal game from the, the comfort of a brown leather armchair in the bar area of my uh, four-star Tui resort. Um, and I, I did catch most of the game, uh, beer in hand. So, yeah, lots to talk about, lots to get into. So I'm excited. And, well, I think my anger, I don't know about yours, where your, where your levels were. I was hot yesterday. I, I've, I've maybe tapered a little bit. Uh, I, I, I've tapered. There's a... We'll get into it. We'll get into it. That's not... That's not spoiling, though. Not... Yeah, All right. yeah, we're gonna we're, we're gonna start with a, a rip roaring review. I'm gonna crack on first. Um, where where my feelings are at right now is this: this a game that we're gonna look back on and feel differently? Feel as though this could have been a game that uh, our season could hang on, and we're only three games in. That's where I was wondering when we talked about this last season, Jason. We had a few games where we dropped points. And in this league, particularly against this Man City side, we need perfection. And Mikel actually said this in an interview in the preseason tour. I think he said, you know, start at 115 points or whatever it is to kind of, you know, to have, have every single game and work backwards from there. We've already dropped two points. Liverpool and Man City have had a perfect start already this weekend. And it's just uh, to get perfection, you need a little bit of luck on your side. And we didn't yeah. have that luck on our side. Um, and I just I wonder, like I said, if we if we look back on this match and and think and feel differently, maybe this is one of those ones that come back to bite us. Maybe it haunts us a little bit. Maybe in the grand scheme of things, this is actually a really good result when we look back on it. We might look back on it differently. Um, the only saving grace for me off the back of this result was probably a bit of hate watching today uh, for the likes of Chelsea, for the likes of Spurs, for the likes of United, uh, and getting kind of almost three for three. Um, that's my only saving grace. Uh, so my 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 I was I was hot yesterday. I was so angry, vitriolic. Uh, was in uh, random people just talking to them about. I just could not fathom what had happened. But we are where we are. I've calmed down a little bit, and I think maybe on reflection, it could be a good point. Um, I don't know what your feelings are, Jace, on that. I think it was a good point in the grand scheme of things. We'll go on to talk about the game. I think, you know, the fact that you, you came out of that game without a loss and there was some quite intense pressure for periods of that game. So, yeah, I think a point is a good result. But I think I I agree with you. I I didn't feel... You asked me, you asked me, like, am I, am I, was I hot? Was I angry? And I think the thing I felt was like this lull, like a low, like a depression a bit. Like, actually genuinely felt low last night um arsenal right Imp impacting my my anxiety and depression who knew it but like genuinely because the fact that we know how many we lost the league by two points last year and we know that every single point counts it's like 30 we now know to win the league it's literally 38 cup finals so when you dropping two points it really hurt me which made me feel so down I don't want to go straight into a down. <laughs> I don't feel like now, now. But at the time, it took me a while to get over it. I, I literally, for the last, since the game, probably for the last 24 hours, it's only just before this podcast, I rewatched the highlights because I was in the I was in the ground. And I haven't watched any football since uh, that game. I was just down. I didn't want to see the results. I didn't watch want to watch United-Liverpool. I, I, 
I, I switched back into my other love, which is F1, right? And, and let's not go there because McLaren should have won today and they didn't. Um, but yeah, like I, I had to I had to detach myself from it a little bit. And that's that's kind of the emotion I took away from it. Uh so yeah, I get I definitely see what you're saying. Yeah. I I, I hate the way that eleven random men can affect your, your mood for a weekend, particularly on a on a twelve thirty kickoff on a Saturday is the most frustrating. If this was now four o'clock on the Sunday, we might might maybe feel a bit differently. Yeah, absolutely. Um Go on and tell me, tell me what your written review is. You said you've calmed down a little bit. What have you calmed down on? Well, I was uh, so obviously we're going to talk about the incident, and 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 I'm sure what I say now will kind of lead into us talking about the sending off as the first topic. But I'm not even going to specifically focus on that element of of. Uh, of this in my my writ roaring review what i will say is that the premier league is meant to be the best league in the world it's a league where we have the best players we have diverse teams with multi multiple different nationalities so we have different players coaching staff managers and fans we're a it's the best league in the world and the most diverse league in the world potentially but the refs are all from manchester uh diversity delivers high performing teams and the Premier League is getting consistently poor results in its refereeing standards. So my RR is it's time for change. We need consistency. We need no more apologies. We need time for action. And I'd instantly bring the top five refs from the best European leagues around, give them the most money, give them the highest paid refereeing salaries in Europe, and just start pumping some diversity into the Premier League refs because the standard is shambolic, absolutely awful. It's an absolute joke. And he's here. Can you hear the anger coming back again? I can. <laughs> but, I, don't, yeah. I, I agree with everything you're saying. So it's not like your anger is unwarranted. I, I, you know, I can't disagree with you. Yeah, that's where I'm at. That's, that's just before we even talk into the incidents and the performance of, of, of Chris Kavner. Um, well, let, me, uh, let me move because uh, our first topic is the state of refereeing. And maybe, maybe if I talk about my feelings because they lead, they lead on we, me and you have not really discussed this and they lead on basically from yours directly um i am perplexed at the inconsistencies that that's the main thing i can i can see by the letter of the law what declan rice has done and the reason why he got sent off in kind of retrospect at the time i don't think i could have seen it i don't think there's any other view in my mind and anybody else's mind that watched it that saw him get kicked and assumed that the other player was going to get sent off i yeah. think that's what everyone else thought uh and then when he pulled out another yellow and gave it to declan rice and declan rice asking like why me i was also i couldn't understand why and, and you know on reflection you kind of look at what happened and by the like i said the letter of the law yeah fine okay kick the ball away if that's what you're going to do but then do that consistently in this game and in other games, there was a there was an incident earlier on in the game with Jao Pedro kicked the ball away significantly more than Declan Rice had, yeah. and got nothing for it. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm not to say that this was me, but on Twitter, someone decided to watch all the games today and watch all the incidents to see how many times the ball was kicked away and delaying in the restart. Kulisevsky, Gehi, Kukarella, Poro, Joe Linton, who was already on a yellow card, Palmer already on a yellow card, Bruno already on a yellow card. It happened like seven or eight times over those games. And the same refereeing standard, like you've mentioned, is just not done across those games. It is, that's all I'm asking for. And I think that's all you're asking for is better standard and consistency of refereeing. And that for me was the, you said it yourself, it's the biggest league, it's the best league, it has the most money, the biggest sponsors, the biggest clubs, the biggest players. It needs the biggest standard of refereeing. And what really irks me, and you can feel the anger coming through my voice now, Jace, you've done it, um, is the fact that this is this is the one where all the global eyes are on it. This is the biggest league. And what we're doing again is just letting Man City run the league. It is an absolute joke that this continues to happen while they sit there with 115 charges and can batter teams with double hat-tricks while the state of refereeing in these other games just can't be done with a level of consistency that allows us to compete on an even playing field. That, for me, is the biggest frustration that I took out of this game. And like I said, I can I can take the letter of the law, but it's ruining the game for me. Yeah, I mean, there's... 
yeah, I, again, uh, there's nothing I can disagree with you there. I'm, I, I completely align with your view. The Jao Pedro one, that one was just like, so Fabian Hertzler, Hertzler is that right? Uh, mm -hmm. Basically said in his press conference interview, these are not the same. Do not confuse these. How the hell are they not the same? Like, I'm sorry. He, Jao Pedro kicked the ball away after the ball had gone out of play. Now you're telling me that he beat because it was on the line, right? He was just about it just gone over, and in theory he could have continued his run. You're telling me that if that if he'd have continued his run, he would have kept up the ball that he kicked in front of him to the goal kick to, to David Raya. Sorry, do one. No, absolutely no way. He has intentionally kicked that ball really far away so that Arsenal cannot take a quick throw in and restart. And it is exactly the same thing. In fact, I would say it's worse than Declan Rice's because for Brighton, they were down the other side. There was no tactical threat, right? Mm. And it was but, a moving ball. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. But for, 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 for us, it was halfway line. So we could have started up the play. Like, it's just so inconsistent. And I, I was, yeah... I, it, just annoys the hell out of me. Uh, the other thing I'd say is like we didn't have a clue what was going on as fans. Absolutely no clue. Because so in the, the way ground, you mean, right? Yeah. So I also didn't have any sound, uh, and also didn't see if it went to VAR. Didn't know what the commentators were saying. So similar to you, you're kind of watching it in real time, experiencing it in real time, trying to put the pieces together. So I was. Uh, I finally got chatting to some people next to me <laughs> in my seat, and. Um, when they gave the yellow and then they pulled the red out, we were like, oh, they sent the Brighton player off. And I looked around and went, no one on Brighton's team already has a yellow. I went, but Rice does. I went, they've sent Rice off. And they were like, no. And I was like, they've sent Rice off. They must have done because Rice was the only, like, Brighton, mm -hmm. Brighton players didn't have any yellows and he'd gone the yellow red. So, like, we didn't have a clue what was happening in the ground. And obviously, they didn't show any replays. So we couldn't even, like, fathom why they'd sent Rice off. It wasn't clear. Because to us, it looked like Rice had been assaulted, <laughs> basically, mm -hmm. from where we were. Um, but obviously, you see in the replay what he does, right? And he, he does knock the ball. I think the fact is that Declan, if that the letter of the law, I kind of agree with that element of it. But the difference is that the letter of the law couldn't be applied because actually it wasn't in a legitimate place to take the free kick. The ball was rolling. Like it was gamesmanship from Brighton and gamesmanship from Arsenal. So, I mean, Deck needs to smarten up a little bit and uh, we'll talk about the consequences of his red card a little bit later. Cause I want to talk about next game, but yeah, uh, Overall, it's the referee. Like, and then don't get me wrong, that obviously was the main talking point for Chris Cavan's performance. But he was awful all round. There were so many bad decisions, inconsistencies in how he was applying, uh, letting play flow and not letting play flow, and giving giving free kicks at certain times. It was like, um. Who's the ref that always, well, they retired, used to make the show about themselves? Mike Dean. Mike Dean. Yeah, it felt like he is the new Mike Dean. Maybe he is, I don't know. But, um, yeah, just, I mean, there's not much more we can say about this topic. No, no. And I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think Chris Kavanagh has made it too much about himself. There is no, but no football fan, whether Brighton or Arsenal, really want to see that game, not 11 versus 11. That's what the players want. That's what the managers want. Fans, of course, will be biased in certain ways to look at that game. But that's what we all really want, to see the best 11 versus another great 11 and play a game of football. And, you know, the fact that he's nudged that ball away by the letter of the law, like I say, it, it's rigid decision-making that has effectively ruined that game. And the rules around VAR in this context is just what has frustrated me a little bit because I get that in certain cases it can and cannot be used. But it just feels like insane to me that someone can't go, just, I think you should have a little look at that. I, I don't necessarily think you've made the right decision there. I'm not going to tell you, but, I, I, you know, go and have a look at it. Um, and I think, I read online this week, uh, just before we move on, I think the last thing I wanted to say was, if you'd shown this video to someone who knew nothing about football, 
and you ask them, out of these two players here that just happened, what what of those two players would not be playing the game anymore because they've been removed from the game? Which which player would you say has, has done the bad thing? And it's Veltman. It's like it's just insane to me to look at that situation and go, ah, oh, yeah, when he's knocked that ball with his toe there, that's ruining the game. Not the fact that he's just booted him. Uh, did, did you see the many things on Twitter X around what happened, obviously, last week with Saliba and um... Ben White and the situation where he kicked him on the ground? Yeah, yeah, it, was, it, was, yeah it, it was professional you, refereeing. It, yeah, because Martin Oliver was just like, just like you know, yeah, six or one half a dozen another. Yeah, like you said, there is gamesmanship by both players, so it's like, have a tell it, like, stop it and then move on. Yeah, like, I don't think in any like, I think Veltman should have been carded, and I'm guessing because Rice did what he did, you can't card Veltman for the incident. I'm guessing that's how it played out. Just don't give either one and move on. Yeah, uh, yeah, and like, like you, I'm kind of a bit. I just wonder, like I said in the written review, this it feels to me it's going to be one of those things that we talk about in the future again, like Newcastle last season. Um, and this because I just wanted to go back. You said Chris Cavanaugh made a lot of it about himself. There was a penalty incident, I think, Ben White shot that hit against Dunk's arm. Mm. Now, you can say it's down by the side of his body. Fair enough. If he was on the goal line and he did the same thing, that would have been given a penalty. That's VAR. That's VAR. Like if he doesn't can't see that in the moment, and that's VAR. It should be calling that up, right? But the, again, that's that's the thing with VAR. It's like the context of when and when it can't be used. It's like just be sensible around it. I know it's got all these rules and rigidness around it, but just be, just use common sense. Like it won't. We've seen how badly it can ruin the flow of the game. I don't think in situations like that it can ruin it. I, I genuinely believe it. Just be like he's unboard it there. Just go and have a look at the screen. That would take 30 seconds. And then it's done. It, it just baffles me. And that's what I'm saying. Look, those kind of the pendulum swings on this game, right? Between decisions such as that, that have ultimately not only affected this game, like you've mentioned already, we've got another really huge game coming up in two weeks. That likely means we're going to have to play Kai Havertz as the eight. And if Jesus isn't fit, we have no striker. Well, let's talk about that in a bit at the end. If we can put that in the in the car parky rival watch section, because I want to talk about that. I want um, to talk about lineups. All right. Well, let's let's talk about let's move on from the refereeing then, because it overall wasn't a bad performance of a game at all. And I think there was there was a lot of players in this game that that stood out to both of us, I suspect, as as uh, you know, overperformers and their stocks on the rise. Who do you think out of this game stood out to you the most? Kai. Kai is Proving every single penny's worth of that transfer fee now. He's getting how many goals has he had now? Is that two goals in three games? And he scored against Villa as well. Yep. Um, and he scored against did he score against Wolves? My memory is going absolutely blank now. I will check while you're talking. But he he was he's been really consistent. There's a there's a actually a great connection between Kai and Saka. Saka's finding him all the time. Um, and th that connection is Turning out to be one of the best kind of part attacking partnerships, I think, in the in the Premier League. And I think having a number nine that is tall and it is a presence is really benefiting. We saw last year, I think, when we played him up front for the first time against Liverpool, instantly the ball's over top and how he's able to make those runs through the middle uh, that pull away from defenders. They're quite unique. I don't even see Harlan doing stuff like that. And that, you know exactly what he did for the goal and the finish was brilliant as well um so he's uh yeah actually he did score against wolves absolutely did i remember it it was a great header um but yeah he's he's um he's he's playing magnificently and we've been a very tricky spot without car habits right now a very tricky spot his he's i'm gonna say it maybe at the moment our most important player didn't I say that on a the first yeah. podcast? Yeah, and I was like, oh, I'm not sure yet. And now uh, I'm like, yeah, he is absolutely. Mm. Yeah, so his, his stock on the rise. Um, yeah, uh, we we would be in a very bad place without him right now. Yeah, I think the fact that he's been unlocked as a as a, and he actually feels like a proper number nine now. Yeah, like he genuinely the runs he's making, the goals he's scoring because that that was a, a proper 
nines finish. That was a proper striker's finish. Um, and it was, you know, there's even, I think there's other fans, like I was sitting around other fans, right? They were just watching it just because it's football. Mm. Now I overhear people saying, you know, it's a proper striker's goal. And I think he's getting more credit now in the performance. He's put two, two goals and one assist in this season already in three games. That's a return every game so far. You're right. Without him, Jesus is just unreliable. We've sold Eddie and Ketia. There's a lot of pressure and weight on those shoulders. And at the moment, you know, he's meeting them. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's been brilliant. And, and then do you want to talk a bit about Saka? Because that's another assist for Saka. Yeah, three. Three this season so far. He's absolutely... I think this is probably some of the best I've seen him play for a while. Um, he was an absolute menace down that right-hand side. I do think that while we're still trying to unlock that left-hand side a little bit, and maybe Mourinho is the key to that at some point in time, everything for us is flowing down that right-hand side, and Saka was an absolute menace. Um, you know, we're, we're not messing around with this guy now. And I, I think I said to you before on the, the previous pod that we did together that he feels to me like he's got a bit of a chip on his shoulder, that he's starting to maybe do this like villainous turn a little bit. And I, I, I actually kind of see some of that a little bit now, even when he was walking off. I think he got subbed off and he was giving it to some of the fans in the away end. And I think he was. I think he's unreal. And I think that, that his, his touch his drive, he, he feels more in that, not the season, last season, the season before, where he would commit men. He would do a lot more one-on-one -on -one take-ons. He would cut inside a bit more. He lost a bit of that last season, maybe because he was doubled up on and tripled up on on occasion. Mm -hmm. But he's still experiencing that this season. And now he feels a bit more, the shackles are off. He feels a bit more like free-spirited. Yeah. And he's certainly, I would say, the best winger in the league by far. Um he was incredible, I think. And it is just unfortunate that, you know, the sending off did kind of change the game a little bit and change what he had to do during that game. It changed everybody's dynamic during the game, right? Because even in the moments where he almost scored, I think it was, was it Kai that put it on a plate for him and he was just yeah. stretched to try and get it? It yeah, wasn't an was, easy finish, put it that way. It was also on the counter as well. I mean, them two connecting, it's just the link up in both directions is great. And um, those two were, I mean, we were on. We didn't score those goals, and that's a bit frustrating. That clinicalness isn't quite been there. I think at the start of the season, um, as I think we were having some higher scoring victories. But um, yeah, the chemistry is is really clear to see. Yeah, I think the first half an hour of that game, we had, we were suffocating them. And you know, Arteta has talked a lot about starving teams of possession. We were all over them. We were we were on the front foot. And it's another game where maybe you're thinking that if we had to put some of the shots away, we yeah. might have been in a different situation, potentially. I don't want to ham on it too much because we've talked about it previously, but it did feel to me there was another missed opportunity somewhat. I do think, I think their keeper made a great save on the Kai Havertz one that we counted on in like 60, 70th minute. It was a really good save, um, which was unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, if we think about it, there was a chance in the first. Saka had a couple of chances in the first half. He was a bit too direct at the keeper from the, from the right side of the pitch. Um, I mean, it was hard finish at the angle we had, but it was straight at the keeper. And then Odegaard has to take that chance in the first half. I think it was in the round the first twenty minutes or so. Around then, uh, ball in over the top from from the left hand side. He runs onto it perfectly, and it's just straight low and down the middle. Like uh, anywhere else, and that's in anywhere else. And he, I, I, it's, it's annoying. The reason I find it annoying is because he did something similar and didn't get the third against Villa. Do you remember last yeah. game? He needs to start scoring those. He needs to start scoring those. He needs some goals as well as his everything else that he brings. Yeah. I mean, maybe we'll get on. I just want to, because I want to talk about Odegaard in a second. The only one other thing I was going to say that the stocks, I don't think it can get any higher at this moment. A little bit is Raya again. I think yeah, that's safe. Yeah, yeah. Another another batch of saves that have saved us points, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. You could have lost this game quite easily without him. There was a lot of talk I saw about potential that he didn't palm the first shot away enough, that then allowed Jao Pedro to score that goal. But you know, he was in a one-on-one -on -one situation. I think the fact that he saved it at all mm -hmm. is is good enough. 
you know they, they, uh, you can ask a lot from a keeper i think that's asking too much but again i think another great performance from him and showing you know the fact that brentford put three past southampton in ramsdale in goal sh- shows that we made the right choice yeah um i, I was counting because uh, there was one save he made and i just went well that's another point and i added it up and i think it's five five of our seven points were because of raya so far this season yeah he, he again like that spine is just going to become an important part of this team and it's critical considering what we've done in our transfer business that i'm sure we'll get on to yeah um i put sell 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 for the stocks on the on the reducing on the reduction mm-hmm. uh you talked a little bit about erdegaard there and i'm not to say that he he was bad or he was poor i think he, he maybe coasted during some of this game but the, the bit that stood out for me was the fact that his final ball there was occasions where that final ball had it have been just a little bit better could have made the difference and that's the type that's when you need those type of players that's when you need a De Bruyne that's when you need a Salah when they're able to put those final balls in and really change the game and kind of left the wanting a little bit and like you say we probably need he needs to add some of that goals and assists and that edge to his game for really to start delivering on the what we all know he can do I think mm-hmm. we've just not seen it yet this season yeah no I mean it's been a quiet start for him I mean, we subbed him, and and it was interesting because I was I was kind of surprised that we subbed him uh, in the second half. But then I also understood why because the way in which we were playing kind of null and void him. He's using the connection between the attack and the kind of lower half of the midfield and with defence. But where we were playing with ten men, it was all counter attack. Where that was how we were going, right? You know, with Saka and Habits. It was it was pretty counter attack football and and suddenly you don't really need the middle man to connect because a lot of the balls are going quite long and we're running running onto them or, or, or pressing quite fast away. So um I understand maybe the substitution, but yeah, just he's not he's not been yet. I don't think we haven't seen the best of him. Which is interesting, considering all of the other players are away on international duty and in, in comparison, this guy had a lovely Put his feet up. Um, we thought he looked hungry, right? Like we thought yeah. he was ready. This season was the one, but maybe that knock that he took against was it Villa? Yeah. Maybe has somewhat. Maybe he's not fully fit. But like you say, we're, we're relying on seventeen-year-old Ethan Namwari if if he's not fit. Well, that, that yeah. Again, I want to talk about transfers. There's so many other like non-match related topics. I think we got to catch up on. Well, I, I had it as my next subject, Jace. If you want to move on to that. Um, I think we need to talk about one other player just before we move on. Thomas Party. He got run past several times. There are some times, and it's not the first game, where he's taken too long with the ball at his feet. And he's just like, he got so lucky a few times and not losing the ball. Uh, he's getting it stuck under his feet. He's dawdling on it. And it's peeing me off. He's lost his spring of pace. He's lost his ability to charge for a midfield with one or two steps, steps and a quick turn. He's lost. He's getting skinned by players. He's leaving us vulnerable. He's also making stupid fouls around our box. Stupid fouls. Like he, he, I can't remember the Brighton player he did it on, but he pulled them back by the back of the shirt on the edge of the area. It's one of those ones where they're going away from goal, and it's like, we'll just let them go away from goal. They're not going to do any damage to you with their back turn to the goal. Yeah. And my question is, what's happened to Jorginho? Why are we not? Is it because he went to the Euros and like Arteta's like just like he's old and he needs a rest? Like Jorginho was playing a lot of games for us last year. Why are we not playing Jorginho? Why? He has, he has a lot of faith in party. I think that much is obvious. Um, and on his day, I, I actually yeah. I don't fully disagree with you. I think I think considering Declan Rice got sent off and we were playing pretty much party as a single pivot. For 40 minutes of that game, I think he did well enough. I I think he actually was put in quite a solid performance. I I wasn't as down on it as maybe I can see why you are because I think we can all agree that his legs are gone and that pace is not his his uh, fortitude anymore. Um, and even his breaking passes that we know he can do are also probably taking too long to to kind of come to fruition. Um, he's labouring over most of it, like you say, and it feels a bit like he's in treacle sometimes. Yeah. Um, but like, I, I do feel, I, to answer the question, I don't know why Jorginho is not playing. Um, 
I just can't. You, you're right, you played a lot last year. So unless there's a niggle, unless he's not fully fit, I, I'm assuming you just trust Pai. Yeah, well, I, I would have rather we had, I'd rather Jorginho have some minutes in his legs before at least the next couple of games because I think we're going to need him. Mm. Um, so, yeah, this is, uh, and that's again just coming on and gives a, he is able to be fair to give him credit to just come on and give a masterclass and then go away uh, again. He's like a, he's like a specialist. You just bring him on for certain games and times when we need him. Well, this but, is why, you know, we, we've got two big games coming up. And if you were to talk about, oh, we don't have rice, but we're going to put Jorginho in, you wouldn't worry. I wouldn't worry. No, I mean, he's, he's, he's all in as well. Like he was, so I don't know if you saw us on the TV yesterday, but so, you know, he was, he was in the technical area. He was, he was coaching. <laughs> he was shouting at the players. He was like, he's up and at him. Um, I think he's a great character to have around, and I just wish we had him on the field a bit more. Obviously, I wish that we had a younger Jorginho as well. But um, yeah, I, I I I think we could have done with him yesterday, to be honest. All right. Well, you mentioned it a little bit. Let's let's move on to some discussion of our transfer business then, because the window's shut. Arsenal have done their business. Many will look at this as a window of selling. And we certainly did do a better job of selling. Um, I'd like to pass you the baton, Jace. We've not discussed this yet. Um, what is your rating of Arsenal's transfer window business? And do you feel that we did enough to cover where we needed to cover? Do you think we were left wanting in any other places? What do you think about Arsenal's general transfer window? Eight out of ten, maybe. I'd say. Uh, we're not a 10 because I think a 10 would have us being us bringing in a number nine um, to back up and, and eventually probably face Jesus out because there was rumours he was there was interest from him from Saudi Arabia. Uh, also, you know, Nico Williams would have been lovely. But I mean, we got the critical positions that we needed. I think we have to kind of ignore the fact that we're losing Rice for the next game and Marino got injured. Thanks, Gabrielle. Um, but our midfield is the depth is there in theory. Uh, so yeah, really, it's um, it's it's been a decent window. I mean, I I personally want to spend some time just talking about Sterling because I so I I'll just get it out here. Right, I love this deal. I absolutely love this deal. I. I Everyone knows I don't have love for Chelsea. Um, and I think what they're doing at the moment is crazy, ridiculous, idiotic, um, possibly illegal, potentially by the letter of the law of how the rules have been written. The fact that you can buy a player for 15 million euros, however much it was, and then sell them to the club that you own in Strasbourg for 21 million euros the next season, having the guy hardly played or whatever it was, it's just stupid. It's just money laundering uh, or whatever the, I don't know, that's what someone said on Twitter. But uh, my, my point is, I love the fact that we played our cards close to our chest. We knew that we uh, we could push Chelsea to the last minute because they they put this on themselves in regards to having too many players. I think... I don't know how much of this is true, but my understanding is that basically we didn't pay a loan fee um, and we're only paying 40% of his wages. And I think I, I think he was on like 300k a week, but I did think he also made some, uh, I think he might have taken... I think we got 350, 350k and we're paying 150 or something like that. Something like that. But like, I mean, let's be honest, Raheem's still a good player. Raheem is he was played good in preseason. He played well overall for Chelsea last year. There was obviously a lot of focus on Cole Palmer. He's only 28, 29, I think now. He's got something to prove. I think he was mistreated by Chelsea. Um, I I don't think they got the best out of him. Uh we all trust in Mikel. Mikel will get the best out of him. I could see us getting him on a free or something next year for a couple of million, and he'll just be in a backup winger and him playing really, really well for us. I think he fits perfectly. 
I also like love the fact that he can play left. I mean, he played a lot on the left for City, a lot. And I actually am not opposed at the moment to just putting him, while they're both fit, putting Saka and Sterling on the wings and have, have us down the middle. I think that would be perfect because Trossard and Martinelli need to sort it out. Um, so, yeah, I, I really like the signing. I think it's great value for money. It's, it's a no-risk signing for us. We keep our cards dry in regards to keeping the money in the bank for the people that we really do want that clearly the market wasn't there for. We wanted Williams. We couldn't get that. We couldn't get Sesco, which is where we clearly want to pay, pay our major money. So I think it's a really astute piece of business. I also love it because, uh, you know, I've talked before about how the media treat Saka um, and, 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 and for England and how I felt about that. Well, he wasn't the first person to experience it. Sterling was. Sterling was the first. I mean, it may be before that, but in my memory, the things were, you know, I always remember, you know, when he got the tattoo, how he was treated, you know, when he bought a house for his mum, how he was treated in the media, like all these stupid things. And there's just a lot of people that that just believe this stuff. And, and you know, he, he I remember when Chelsea fans racially abused Sterling, it was just awful, right? And then he ends up playing for them. I'm not brandishing everyone with the same brush here, just to be clear, but the fact is, I love the fact that him and Saka are going to play on the same team. I just think it's a really um, us against the world kind of story. I really like it, and I just love—I just love the thought of him playing for us. I think he just fits us really well, and the fact that we aren't paying any money for him—I just love it. It's brilliant. I'm with. I mean, I, I had a friend text me two weeks ago when it first, maybe the rumor, maybe first came about, and he was like, "What do you think?" And I was like, "No, not for me." And then, like you, the business that we've done, and I, I want to ask you a question after this. I, I agree with everything you're saying. Raheem is by no means washed. The drop-off between when Saka is either not fit, needs a rest, etc., to go to Sterling is not major. He had uh, 12 goals and assists last season for not that many starts for Chelsea. He's still a, a, a very astute very uh, good player. Maybe doesn't have the pace that he used to have, but certainly can can dribble, can one on one, can score. Um, a great backup option, left and right, can go through the middle as well. So if Sack, um, if Havertz does need to drop into a midfield position, Sterling is an option as a forward entity, maybe in a Carabao Cup or something similar. Um, the business side of the deal, you're right, is absolute perfection. Like, I feel it's absolutely insane to get a player of his caliber with no loan fee and paying hardly any of his wages, having another team pay the majority of his wages while he plays for us in a title challenging team is is incredible. Incredible. Um, so I, I, I don't disagree with all of that. The only thing I would say, and it feels to me like a, quite a dangerous game leaving it as late as we left it and i get the fact that you're saying that and, and ornstein had this quote in an interview that he did which was it's so correct it, this is not playstation this is not a football manager you know you can't just go i want nico williams his 300 million thank you very much i'll take your nico williams um we obviously had targets like you said we had him and we had sesco those are the two players that we wanted to get i don't think nico williams will ever happen i think that right. he obviously wants to go to barcelona i think sesco will um i i think that his agent did quite an astute thing and kind of basically said just do do the business get another good contract offer from from a red bull go and smash in the bundesliga again this year and you'll get an even better offer next year from arsenal because they will come knocking and we i think we will but it kind of feels like we were quite rigid in our transfer business we had targets and before we have talked about plan A's and plan B's, you know, when we got Trossard, Trossard was not our plan A. Mudrick was our plan A. And we, we, you know, we went through the motions. And maybe Sterling is a great stopgap until we get whatever wing in this is. But it has now been, and this is where I want to get maybe a bit critical. It's been three years now and we've not signed a good forward player. We've not really signed a plan A forward player. And this is where I feel that we're being somewhat too rigid in our approach to how we handle transfers and how we do business and the non-negotiables that Arteta is looking for, that if we don't get them, then we just go to go and do something else instead. Calafiori is a player. He's a great player. Not denying it. Did we need another left back? I'm not so sure. We've got Chinchenko. We've got Kiwio. We've got Timber. We've got Tomiyasu. It's a, a position that we're overloaded with. 
maybe we were trying to offload some of those maybe we weren't i don't know but it just feels to me that like Arteta has this blind spot to those forward players we've yet to really crack that nut and again if we don't win the league this year i still feel that's the question that's going to be posed it, last year it got the question that was posed and we scored the most goals we'd ever scored and it still got asked so that that's where my head's at i just wanted to be a bit I don't rate it as highly as you. I think it's a good window. And if you look around all the other clubs, what they were doing, nobody is going, let's ignore Chelsea and Man United because they're both shit shows and they're doing their own thing. Everyone else who's a rival wasn't really doing very much either. Liverpool signed Chiesa. That was it. I think City signed uh, Sil- Silvina. I, I don't know how to pronounce Silvina. it. That was it. Like So I, I think that you're right. And as you get better and better and better, Finding good players gets harder. Not only because other teams know you've got money to spend, and so they're going to be up in the prices, but to get better players and raise your ceiling, ra- um, sorry, raise your floor rather than maybe your ceiling becomes challenging. But I would say, if we're saying there's nothing in the market that's better than Reese Nelson and Gabby Jesus, I think we're lying to ourselves. I think there's plenty of options. Yeah, well, there are, there, there is better options out there like but uh, the challenge is how realistic is it to get those players that are out there so you know Sesco made this was a realistic option because he was at a Leipzig right and I mean the Premier League is optional so who else is better out there well you could say Ollie Watkins but Villa ain't going to sell Ollie Watkins to us unless it's for an extortionate price well out of our transfer budget that's just not happening we're not we're not taking him and does he fit the profile of the player we actually want I mean I've got personal bias. I would love to have seen someone like Folly at Arsenal, but we weren't getting we weren't gonna get Ollie Watkins. Dominic Solanke, 65 million. It's a big money. We want to pay that. Are we gonna gamble to pay that? Who else is there? You know, if we're talking about competing with City, then we're saying we need our version of Erling Haaland. Who's the Erling Haaland out there? Because I don't know who that I don't know who that equipment yeah, but is. I, I mean you you this is where you Vlahovic, Isak, uh I know you said Solanke. Like, I'm just Ottoman. There, there, there is options, and this is I think I think Arteta and Edu are very rigid in their thinking of who they want as their target, and they're more than happy to wait for those players to become available if that's what's going to happen. But football is a fast-moving business, and if you kind of sit and wait for some of these things to happen, you may find that something else is going along over here that you've not had the chance to notice. That's that's my only worry here. I don't think that, you know, I agree with you. I, Ivan Tony went to Saudi for 40 million. You were on here many, many times, Jason, right? Talking about that he was I would, the, the I man for job. Well, the, I do think he would. I would have take the, the footballer in him, I would take. But I think it comes down to I've. The thing that stands out for me is the culture that we're building at the club, the way of behavior, the personality traits of all the players. And it's like that has really clearly been one of the key reasons why we have not brought certain players in. Ozzyman, I think we could have gone for him, but I do not think the personality traits and the cultural fit. But but this is, yeah, but this is what I'm saying. The the rigidness of the non negotiables feel like they are somewhat. I get culture. There's a, a saying in business. What is it? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and if you don't have the right culture, no matter what you do in the backroom staff, in the team, that can mm-hmm. completely derail everything. So I, I, I mean, I get that. But there is there is an element here that I think there will be some question marks getting raised over Arteta if he doesn't win the league or doesn't win a trophy again this season. I Not mean, from the yeah. fan base, I don't think, but I think externally... You know, we're already the maybe men. We're already the bottlers twice in a row. Um, that is only going to get louder. And it's going to make the victory all the more sweeter, Jason. I don't disagree with you. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I just wanted to play the other side of the coin. Yeah, I, I, I get your side of the coin as well, right? But, I, I mean, I'm, I just don't think the players were there that we wanted. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 think that's, I think that's factual. I think that's how Arteta, how, how Arteta looks here. But that's to say there's not something that can improve the level of our squad out there is not true. Um, and it just means that you're probably right. If you bought a Tony, you can't buy Sesco next year, is basically what we're saying. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and for, for Arsenal, we, we have had many years of maybe strikers since the likes of, um, well, Van Persie, basically. Ever since then, we've had a, a lot of maybe strikers. I think Alexis Sanchez, although not really a striker, was probably the only true X Factor player. Olivier Giroud? I, I mean, I, you know, you know my feelings on the, the French god. Uh, but like he is he, he, he underrated, but he's no way near like an X Factor striker, yeah. I know, but I even think Olivier Giroud type striker come signing would have been a good one, right? Like someone who can then swap in and out for habits. Well, you're seeing some of, some of the boxes and balls that we're playing into the box, he'll be eating them for breakfast, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I would have could have done with him. Okay. Um, can we talk about lineups? Have you got that on the list? No, but we can we can talk about lineups because um, I but, you're going to talk about the Tottenham game, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, we need to. I mean, I'm assuming before we move on to rival watch, we need to kind of talk about what's going to happen in this next game. How are we going to play? How are we going to set up? I the question mark I had is if the Marino arm injury is a smoke screen, so he doesn't go on international duty, and he's actually okay. If he is, then I think we probably play him, Jorginho, Erdegaard. If he's not, then I'm not sure. Havertz will have to drop into the eight. And then who do we play up front other than Raheem Sterling? You think... I, I'm intrigued to see that you think that that's a smokescreen. I mean, he's genuinely... He's got a shoulder fracture, they said. So that's six I know, eight. I know, but I mean, it just seems like... A for a guy, eight. the only reason I'm saying it right is for a guy who apparently is one of the best, best in jewels in all of Europe. He's got into one training session and come up against the the, the Brazilian Monstoro, and now he's come <laughs> out with a fractured shoulder. Just you know, it, it's just funny. I mean, I just think Gabby needs to calm down a bit. <laughs> every every uh, game's a cup final, Jay. She said it yourself. Yeah, I know, but it's training. Can't injure your new signing straight away. <laughs> um, well, what, what do you think is going to happen then? So I, I mean, I'm assuming that we have no Marino and no Rice. Uh, I would be playing Jorginho. I think he's a specialist for big games. So I think he fits in there. Hear me out on this one. I don't think Jesus will be fit. So I think that we have to play Habits up front. So then how don't do you feel? It. Don't say it. What, what do you think I'm going to say? <laughs> Well, you're either going to say, well, you're going to say one or two. I'm going to let you do it. Go on. So I would move Odegaard across to the other side. Okay. I'd put Saka in Odegaard's position and I'd play Sterling on the right. I mean, that is not what I thought you were going to say. Because Saka has that ability, right? They talked about he could play in midfield. He can play, he can play a ball. He can play a pass. He's got the ability to twist and turn. I... I, and then you still have the benefit of Odegaard doing the same position, but on the other side, because I would feel more confident with three people like that in our midfield who have got energy, who are able to run, who have legs, and that can be tactically aware, opposed to one losing habits up front, because then I don't think we have someone that can score up front. I mean, it's too much of a gamble to play three short players on the front, like it is. We can't play with Trossard. Martin and Lissac or Sterling all on the front three. We need we need habits. Um, and then uh, I don't. I would love to just drop Van Wery into the into the lineup. I would love to have the ability not to just game. not this game. It's Spurs, yeah, exactly. Spurs away first start in the Premier League. I don't think if he, if if Arteta it's does, the type of game that makes or breaks a player, isn't it? Really, yeah. That, you know, it could be unreal and it could be catastrophic. Yeah. So that's why I say what I say. Well, so I, I I would say the way I said the what I thought you were going to say is either Zinchenko or Timber coming in, Urian maybe, uh, maybe Urian. I wouldn't but go Zinchenko maybe. I, I just can't see him disrupting the system. In the the, the the most sensible situation here is that Gabby Jesus is fit. He plays up front. Havertz drops into the left. Jorginho plays alongside him, and that's what we do. That feels to me the the, the probably. So we've always got parties. You might say party and Jorginho. What, a double pivot. Yeah. I just can't see him disrupting the system too much. I think I think Party Jorginho is a bit too uh defensive, a bit too cumbersome. 
a bit, you know, it's not very dynamic. That's why Havertz is the A. I think that might, it's a bit more forward. Mm. But let's see what the Marino news brings. Because if it's Marino, I think it'll be Marino party, Erdegaard, Havertz up front. Yeah. Bless you. Fair enough. Um, right. Yeah, let's, uh, well, I, I'll go on to Spurs because they, they got beat today by Newcastle um, in a bit of rival watch. I would, you know, I said that earlier, I was hate watching this weekend's football. And that yep. is one that I just enjoy. It was it was nice to watch Spurs be on top for quite a substantial part of that game to get dismantled uh, by some pretty simple football. I still love the way that Ange plays football from an Arsenal standpoint, because I think if we play the way that we play football, we're going to carve them open at will uh, when we play them. He says now, um, please don't, you know, this is recorded for posterity, but like uh, not not wanting that to come back and bite me. Um, but there you go. Uh, and I would say that like, they just don't look that good. Um, there, there's nobody in their lineup that I'm particularly concerned about. They've got a few horrible players. Like I look at that Romero and I just look at him and I was like, you just look like a twat. You look like a twat. And I, I'm not looking forward uh, to seeing some of the jewels that he brings. Um, but yeah, nice to see them lose. So it's great analysis. <laughs> if you've come for, you know, I don't, I don't watch Spurs for the, the, the tacticos <laughs> or anything of that. I watch them to lose and then to laugh at them while they lose. The same way that I, I watch Man United. I watch Man United so I can straight away get on that phone and text all my Man United friends that Casemiro is un so washed, it's unbelievable. He got hooked at half time. He, he dropped an absolute stinker, absolute stinker. Probably one of the worst halves of defensive midfield football you will ever witness. Gave the ball away four times. One of them, he just kicked the ball in front of him. And he, he was like, I can't be bothered to run for that. I'm not going to make that. So I'm just going to leave it. And they, it was still on. And Liverpool just got it. And like he just kept on loose pass after loose pass. Their midfield is shocking um you literally liverpool just would walk through it trent alexander arnold was having a field day he just played passes through their midfield like a knife through butter three nil was probably nice could have been a lot worse i haven't watched um, the game um, yeah, I mean, one, I, yeah one thing what? i did see before the game funny was uh, a quote from ten Hag saying after man city we've won the most trophies in the last two years so we're clearly like the best the, the second best team and uh, I saw someone else reply to it going, it's nice to see that uh, that, that May United finally have a manager that's as delusional as their fans. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. And I, I can't disagree with any of that because it, it is just one of one of my, oh, and, and you know him as well, we have, we have a mate who's a Man United fan and uh, we always wonder how many games it's going to take for him to, to give up watching Man United. And it's probably about three games at the moment and he's already had enough. Um there was a period of Arsenal fandom that you you know all too well, as I do, where it was horrible to watch. Yeah. Um, and we've been to games where it's been horrible to watch. And it's just nice that it's not us. It's nice to sit at the nice table with the silver cutlery, the five-course dinner, the nice pudding, the great starter, and having to watch other teams scrap around at the takeaway, at the kebab shop, <laughs> trying to figure out what the hell is going on. It's just nice to see. And I, I revel in it for as long as I can revel in it. We've had the shit. Now let's just enjoy. Even if we're not winning it, it's just good to be in the conversation. It's great to be up there. It's great to be competing. And it's just nice to watch teams like Chelsea, teams like United suffer. I love it. I don't disagree. You know my feelings on Chelsea. You know my feelings on Spurs and United. So my, my son asked me, he goes, yeah, who, who's the team that you hate the most? And he thought I'd say Tottenham. And I was like, I like you. I'm like, it's Chelsea. I don't know why. It's because we went on the tube that one time with their fans. And I think it just, those fans were... To sticks. Yeah, yeah, just, they just weren't nice people. And um, it sat with me ever since. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. So... We've got international break now, right? So yeah, uh, we'll probably do. We'll try and I wanted to try and get another special guest on, so we'll be on the hunt. Uh, so you might see uh, another Rip Roaring Fives over the international break. 
Um, otherwise, uh, we'll see what we can get up to, Jace. We might be able to just enjoy some time reveling in that one all to hopefully get back for Spurs away. Let's see. We'll see. Just no injuries. Pray for no injuries. Yeah, in pray for no injuries. Is I've already done my fantasy football transfers as well, so I'm also... Don't nobody get injured, please. That'd be great. Harlan, more money in transfer. No, don't. Well, uh, yeah, all right. I'll, I'll allow Harlan to be injured. That's fine. <laughs> I didn't, I did, as I said, I start, I, I pulled myself away from football after that one on result just to get away from the low I was feeling. And uh, but I did look at the Man City, I knew Man City had won, but I, I, but I actually didn't look at any like who scored. And I looked at it today and I was like, Harlan Hattrick, I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, like, can you just like. <laughs> just it's just it's a robot like it's just it's just all disgusting it's just it's got eight hat tricks in 69 games i think it is it just feels unfair <laughs> it does um, i just yeah and the th- what the, i think the worst thing about it is in some games you look at how he plays and you're like he's just not involved in this game he looks really lethargic he's just not playing very well and then out of nowhere scores a bloody hat trick yeah, and it's like you know when Kane used to play for Spurs, and he'd be like, "I'm not involved in the game, so I'm going to drop deep, and I'm going to try and get involved, I'm going to pass the ball around to try and feel like I'm in the game." Yeah. It's kind of that, but he was really good at it. And then he, he Harlan just then goes, "It is really painful to watch from our side because we, we do have to be, like I said earlier, absolutely perfect, yeah. and we haven't been yet." Right, Great. Uh, Great. that'll be it. Uh, for, for Brighton versus Arsenal, one or ended. If you're watching this on YouTube, like I've said before, please do give the channel a subscribe. Please do give the video a like. Please do comment down below what you thought of the match and that absolutely catastrophic refereeing display from Chris Kavanagh. Jace, if they are on their podcast provider of choice, what do we want our audience to do? Make sure you subscribe on your podcast provider of choice. Give us a review, five stars, no less, please. And uh, yeah, leave a comment if you want. Nice, and we will see you again very, very soon. Thank you all. Cheers, guys. Come on, you!